Hi everyone, it's Wednesday. Hope you're doing well. And uh, to follow up things we were talking about last week, we started a, a discussion on bloating and what could be causing that. And, and initially talking about it, we talked about what was happening from a stomach standpoint and the fact that we may be low on enzymes and stomach acid, etc. And now as we move further down the intestinal tract, the next part can be also a problem. And so today I wanna to talk a little bit about a, a diagnosis of what we call SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, which is a lot easier to say, obviously. And SIBO basically is the overgrowth of bacteria. Now the, the small intestine really should be fairly sterile, not a ton of bacteria there, but when you get types of bacteria that are not supposed to live there and they overgrow, then you can have increased production of methane and hydrogen gas, which then causes extensive bloating and distension of the abdomen. And as a result, people really feel horrible and they're not, you, you can get peripheral symptoms as well. You can get some some joint pain, so arthritis issues, you can have increased risk of lipopolysaccharides, which are byproducts of these bacteria that can then leak into the system and cause increased issues in the brain, particularly anxiety, depression, as well as issues with perhaps autoimmune disorders, chronic issues in that realm, and then even increased risk for cancer. So. It's, it's imperative that we look at this and approach it in a way that helps to heal it. And it's not just using antibiotics, although antibiotics can be helpful, but then we have to really look at ways of preventing it as we move forward. And that requires changes in diet. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the recommendation for treatment for SIBO is starting off with, with changes in nutrition. And the first recommendation is a lo what we call a low FODMAP diet. So you may or may not have heard of FODMAP, F-O-D-M-A-P, but basically what that stands for is um, fermented foods and oligosaccharides, which are uh, types of carbohydrates, disaccharides, which lactose is one, these have two sugars, and then monosaccharides such as fructose, so groups of fruits can be problematic, and then polyols, which are generally sugar alcohols. So the, um, what happens is these fermentable sugars are broken down by the bacteria and increasing risk of production of methane and hydrogen gas, which are very distensible and very uncomfortable for folks. So recommendations for a low FODMAP diet, so, and also reducing obviously sugar and carbohydrates. The specific antibiotics, one that's specifically for this problem and generally not absorbed peripherally is Zyfaxin and that treats it well, but not all insurance companies cover it. So oftentimes we have to use other antibiotics such as Cipro or Bactrim, et cetera. You also want to avoid lactose, which is the sugar in milk. You wanna increase vegetables, increase fiber, soil-based and regular-based probiotics, as well as avoiding artificial sweeteners, because that can be problematic. So there are a lot of changes that can be um, implemented to help improve this. And there are risk factors. You know, low stomach acid is a problem, intestinal um, overgrowth of uh, these bacteria can result from IBS, antibiotic overusage, if you have a history of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis as well, intestinal surgeries, diabetes, these all can contribute, uh, celiac disease, and just understanding that, that this peripheral, dis this abdominal distension is just really uncomfortable and has much more than just local effects. You can get all these peripheral effects and more than 40% of, of chronic diseases can really start, if not all, honestly, start in the gut. So we wanna heal the gut and after antibiotics, it's important that we do institute a lot of changes. You want to definitely get a nutrition-based food program that is whole food, more vegetable and plant-based, as well as good, healthy protein sources 
but staying away from all those processed foods and all those sugars and trying to eliminate those so that you don't produce this gas and that we don't get these peripheral effects long term. So days that you wake up and you're just the day goes on and you get more distended and you have much more joint pain, you might want to consider making some of these changes, whether or not you need to be treated fully with antibiotics or not. The test for this particular disorder of SIBO is a breath test where you're given lactulose and you are then, we measure methane and hydrogen gas production. And it is uh, a test done in the lab. But empirically, if you just tend to have a ton of bloating and it, you, you look pregnant after you've eaten for hours, then this is a real possibility. And uh, empirically, we have done just antibiotic use and then working on this dietary, these dietary changes. So we've talked a little bit about issues with the stomach and digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes also are very help, helpful and powerful here in addition to the probiotics. So understanding probiotics are bacteria and healthy bacteria that we try to get back into the gut and the soil-based uh, probiotics can be very helpful in that area. And then um, getting digestive enzymes as well. So a little bit about the gut health the last couple of weeks. And you know, if we heal the gut, we heal the body. And it really goes back to what was thought to be the case centuries ago. And so minding the gut and really taking care of that as a garden is quite important and quite powerful in our overall health. Hope you all have a great week and we will talk again next week. I'm probably gonna do some book reviews coming up. If you all have any areas that you would like for me to discuss, please let me know. You can just respond to this email and uh, happy to, um, to address any issues that are coming up. You all stay well and we'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>